Well, all right, everyone. Welcome back to another networking video. This is Professor Bruce Hartpence, and we are going through the Packet Guide to Voice over IP. This next couple of videos, we'll be covering Chapter 3 on SIP, or the Session Initiation Protocol. And this will be Part 1. To recall some of our basic operation here, I just wanted to remind you that most voice over IP systems include a couple of different services or uh, protocols. So here we have a small topology. You can see that there's an asterisk box here that is acting as our server and our registrar. And then we've also got a TFTP and a DHCP server. And then there's a couple of phones there. And the first thing that happens is that the phones have to get DHCP based addresses from somewhere. You can do this statically, but most people uh, do DHCP. And then it's very common, especially for desktop phones, to go out and look for a, a TFTP server somewhere. They download the latest firmware, download settings files, things like that to tell them about the configuration for the network. One thing that they might pick up is where the call server is. All right, so that's that's to, to get us going. Of course, there's a PoE switch in the middle, and these things have nothing to do with voice over IP in particular, but they are part of many voice over IP systems. After DHCP and TFTP are finished, we now contact the call server. And in this case, we are gonna use a new signaling protocol called SIP. Now, if you remember right, Voice over IP is really broken down into two kinds of protocols. We have the signaling protocols, and then we have the transport protocols. Our three major signaling protocols are H.323, Skinny, and SIP. All of these use RTP as the transport protocol. So that's something we have in common, and we'll talk about RTP in another series of videos. But right now we're talking about the signaling protocol. Unlike H.323 and Skinny, we're going to go to port 5060 for SIP. And SIP um, has all of the familiar functions that we have with H.323 or Skinny. That is, we have the phones to register. We have to find a way to contact other stations to let them know that we want to talk to them. So these are all things that are handled by our signaling protocol. So let's talk a little bit about SIP specifics. SIP is the session initiation protocol. Well, what is a session? A session is when we are going to establish a transfer of voice data between two nodes. Really what we're talking about here is real-time data in all its forms. The most common is voice over IP. So when you set up a connection between two endpoints, really you have a session. Now SIP, unlike 323 or Skinny, is an RFC based protocol. So you can pull down the RFCs anytime you like. They're IETF documents. And we're going to start with 3261. Now that is the sort of finalized version, although SIP has a lot of companion RFCs. And remember that the basic features and functions that we have here is being able to register with a gateway, being able to contact a remote node find a way to establish the parameters for the call. These are all things that we're trying to accomplish with the signaling protocol. Now, H.323 has H.225 and H.245 to accomplish these two things. SIP has its messages or methods and also the session descriptor protocol that allows us to swap the parameters for a particular session. Basic parts of a SIP topology really include the user agent, and it has a couple of formats, and then proxies, redirects, and registrar server. Now, the, the central part of this is the user agent, and this is really sort of divided up into two ideas, whether or not you're a client or whether or not you're a server. Now, already we can start confusing things, but I'll just start with this way. Let's think about a call server or a call manager. This is typically going to be a user agent server which means that it accepts requests from the clients and sends back responses to client queries. The user agent client initiates those requests and then accepts responses from the, uh, the server. Now, the tricky part here is that a device acting or using a UAS can actually be a UAC as well. Proxy is part of SIP topologies. Actually, it's part of a lot of topologies. 
the proxy here in this case is when you have calls that are forwarded on behalf of nodes or endpoints to another system or to another device. So this is what the proxy does. The proxy takes this call information or the invites and then forwards them on. It's not uncommon to see proxies used between systems. Now another big part of SIP is the addressing that's being used. We're used to phone numbers, but SIP brings us into an era in which we use domain name services and email accounts and all that kind of stuff. So now we have something called the SIP URI or SIP Uniform Resource Identifier, which is very similar to the email addressing that you're used to using. Now this makes it much easier to contact and find other entities on the network. So we're used to saying, well, I want to send an email message to this person at this particular domain. And SIP allows us to do the same thing too. Now that doesn't mean that you can't use phone numbers, just like you use everywhere else, but there are a couple of other formats that we, that we use. Now one handy detail to remember is that when you're setting up SIP trunks, this is the format that we like to use. So you establish accounts on either side of the trunk, and then you forward those trunks to those particular users. And there are some examples of SIP addressing below. Now these are some of the key SIP messages or the SIP requests. Register, this is where you're going to contact the call server and try and log in or try and establish that you're part of the system. An invite is used when you're calling somebody. Trying and ringing are very similar. Uh, ringing is typically from your own call server. Trying is a lot of times we see this in between systems because the call server has, doesn't have direct contact with the called node or the other endpoint. And lastly, we have that session descriptor protocol that I mentioned earlier. It's actually defined in yet another RFC. And this is what we use to set up the parameters of the call. And SDP messages are actually wrap, wrapped up inside SIP messages. And here's an example of a SIP message. Here we see the header expanded. And this one in particular is called an options message. Now, if you look all the way down at the bottom of this, you'll see the allowed. These are all the methods that this particular endpoint or server is, is willing to support. And this one happens to be that options message. And we can see the type of system. You can see the port number used. And so as we go through the videos, what we're going to be doing is tracking SIP conversations using messages like this. But one of the very handy things about SIP, especially when you compare it to protocols like H.323 is that it's very easy to read. It's very simple to see what's happening. Well, that will about do it for this week's video on SIP. Next time out, we're going to do SIP Part 2. And remember that this is Chapter 3 of the Packet Guide to Voice over IP from O'Reilly Publishing. I hope you take a look around the rest of the channel here. There's lots of other videos and networking from all kinds of different topics. You can head out to bruceharpens.com and go to the resources there. We put stuff out there all the time. Thanks very much for watching. Thanks for listening. And may your packets always reach their destinations.